Yeah, I think the, the science we have for these is more of a more of an approach of philosophy than a than a set of rules. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an approach which involves um, you know, acting systematically, testing hypotheses, collecting data, you know, to support those hypotheses. So it isn't really you know a procedure. It is it is a, um, a philosophical approach, if you like. What about internal and external validity? <coughs> internal validity is when your um, sample data is correct, and then external when you can generalise it to the whole population. Yeah, what do you mean by correct? Um, they represent what it means. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so internal validity, if you get some data um, on a set of samples, Inter it's internally valid if that data really does represent those samples. It is an accurate reflection of what those samples are like. And it's externally valid if you can then use that result to make uh, statements about a more general population. So you take a sample of um, people on the streets, you know, ask them some questions about maybe how they're going to vote in the next election. It's internally valid if, those, if your results do really reflect what they are going to do, and it's externally valid if you can then say, well, you know, we think in that case the population as a whole is going to go some sort of way. How about ethics? Why, why do we want ethical procedures? So this is uh, over the last week, isn't it? <coughs> why might you want to have a set of ethical standards, ethical procedures to cover your, your research, your evaluation, your work with the participants. Those involved in the work in this research study, this is the production of data that's the key part of the process. Yeah, essentially, that's the same thing. You need to uh, protect the people involved in your research, the people who are essentially using to help you do your studies, they need to be protected. We don't want to harm them in any way. So, slightly more difficult one. Can, can, can people remember the, uh, the eight key principles? Let's see if we can get a list of them. Uh, list them down. We do well if we can get these from memory because I can't remember them off the back of my head. Let's see if we can write them out between us. So, does anybody? I'll get you started. So competence is, is the first one. Anyone remember all that was about? Integrity. Integrity is another one, yeah. So these are these are about how the um, evaluator, if you like, <coughs> behaves. So competent. You need to be competent to have the skills necessary to do the job, otherwise, you know, it won't be done properly. Integrity, yeah, that's about um, well, conflicts of interest. So, you know, you don't want to be uh, have a vested interest in the results <coughs> of the particular research you're doing. Anyone come up with any other six uh, key ethical principles? scientific method, that's, uh, that's all of them too, so you have to be uh, scientific, what about the way in which you behave towards the participants? Yeah, respect, yeah. Well, trust, I think, is, is the way it's phrased, but it's yeah, essentially the, the same thing. You have to gain the trust of the uh, of anybody you're, you're working with. It kind of comes along with confidence and integrity. So, it can be seen as a, as 
slightly different, that's a different point. Well, respect. Respect means in the context of uh, working ethically. Kind of comes back to the, uh, the core point of question three. Why why are you want ethics? And you said that was to protect, essentially to protect anybody we're working with from harm. So respect is Again, have respect for people you're working with. You know, don't don't just treat them as, as subjects. Treat them as uh, real human beings with needs and so on. Okay, just go through the the other two. So justice. Um, that's a slightly well, it's not odd, but it's a, perhaps difficult to kind of link what it the title with what it actually is. So justice is um, making sure that the people who are involved in evaluation. Uh, are potentially to benefit from the uh, results of the research, so it's kind of fair that they're involved in it. Um, I'm going to point to my script sheet here. What have we got there? Responsibility, yep, so that's um, So that's, um, you know, you have a responsibility not just to the people um, involved in the evaluation, but also to the wider community. And finally, which one do I missed out? Uh, yeah, benefits. You must. Um, research must have some potential benefits of it, is. Okay. So, last week we were talking about, um, we'll start off the process talking about how we would evaluate our uh, any software tools, websites, and so on. Um, and in the past we've looked at how we might uh, collect information about um, to help us design the user interface design the user experience. And now we're going on to, we, we built the tool, how do we determine whether the, uh, the system, the user interface, is effective or not? So what tools might we use to do this? This is kind of the focus of, of this week's lecture. The techniques and tools for measuring um, effectiveness of a user interface. So what, what might we use? Of techniques might we want to apply to, to you know to determine whether or not our user interface is effective. Um, you could have a set of tests and then tests and then participants each other in them and they can also carry it. Okay, so what sort of things might be for us? Well say um, your interface is trying to solve some problem or about the user to perform some actions then you want to make sure that these actions are easy to perform. Okay, so maybe you get the users to do some testing and measure success rate that <coughs> Yeah? Okay. Any others? Okay. Well, I think one that Google, I've seen Google use is that um, they, they make a certain kind of the user interface and they'll film you. Um, to monitor your, you know, uh, how easy you find the interface. Okay, so user observation. Yeah. Yeah. Any others? You could maybe serve different uh, um, interfaces with slight differences to different users without them knowing, and then measure which one does better. Yeah, if you if you wanted to uh, compare to Two different uh, possibilities for user interface. You can uh, you can use use a, a, a study to compare compare the two. Yeah, that's that's normal. What about um, you know maybe 
just about asking the people, you know, what do you think? So conducting interviews um, or uh, or group discussions, so focus groups, you know, you want to know what people think of your interface, ask them. Yeah? Observing them is very effective, um, but so is asking them actually. You can get a lot of information from just asking, them. especially if you do it in the right way. Any other ways you might think of? So we've got down on the list here. Uh, participant observation. Um, you know, that covers a whole range of things, either sitting and watching, or more remote types of observation, such as um, you know, filming them, or even kind of software logs that kind of count as uh, observation. Uh, you've got task analysis. This is essentially um, getting people to perform tasks and uh, observing them, whereas possibly the observation might think of as more um, just talking them generally, you know, task analysis is observing how people do particular tasks, so get them to do a task and, and see how they do, see any problems they have, make notes of the problems, and, uh, and quite possibly collect uh, data such as timing, Task completion, success rates, and so on. Uh, what else? We've got focus groups. So focus groups, you know, they speak for themselves really. But by um, getting people to have a discussion between themselves, you're going to have a group of people having a discussion, and kind of more likely to uh, to open up about any problems rather well than you know saying, well, you know, what do you think of my interface? It's good, isn't it? You know, if you get people to have a, a discussion, they're much more likely to. Uh, I'll be open about problems, you're quite likely to get a, a different range of, uh, of issues, a better understanding of what, uh, what goes on with your, your interface. Um, interviews, okay, that's uh, covered. Uh, you've got to be very careful how you do it though. Um, you know, the sort of questions you ask, you don't want to be asking leading questions, and uh, there's a real uh, well-known tendency for people to want to agree uh, and to uh, try and please the, uh, the questioner in these sort of situations. You've got to be very wary of that. So, social. What does Simon mean by social? Um, this is kind of a technique of observing people in a more social setting. So say you, you've implemented your system into a company, um, you might want to, you can get information about what people, what people think of these other techniques, but uh, you know, just being involved in social settings and listening to the chatter about it can also get you a lot more, um, a lot more data. So, you know, so just general social situations, collecting information about what people think, rather than uh, more formal techniques such as interviews. And archive, this is, these are all very similar to the techniques we use for gathering requirements. Um, archive is, uh, you know, just explore the documents, don't ask the people directly, explore the documents, explore the evidence, see what people have actually been doing with the system. And that can give you clues as well. So, just as before, when we were gathering requirements of the system, you know, we've got this, we've got all this data from the users, you know, what they think they might need to do, what they want to be able to do, and we need to pass that information on to, you know, the developers who are going to code it. Um, there are a whole range of techniques for doing this, and essentially the same sort of techniques can be applied for, you know, understanding or analysing the results of these, these studies. To, uh, to do your evaluation and make any, perhaps any changes you want to make to your evaluation. Anyone uh, remember some of the techniques that we used for disseminating the uh, user requirements to developers? The uh, personas? Yeah, personas. Uh, use cases. Use cases, yeah. Any others? People remember what these are. Anybody else remember what the sellers and use cases are? 
and you know, this is quite a, quite a stack of techniques. Requirement tables, non-functional non and uh, functional. Yeah, uh, also these are more formal techniques such as UML. Um, what else have we got? And I'll start there. Flow charts, state diagrams. You know, some of these are perhaps a bit more suited for the uh, for the requirements gathering phase of the project. Um, Whereas others are, are equally uh, at home when you're doing your evaluations. So, on to the technique set. One of the um, kind of easier ways of exploring how effective a, you know, a software artifact website is on is to do a, an expert evaluation. So this involves basically getting an expert in and uh, asking them to evaluate it in a, in a number of different ways. Um, two key ways are walkthroughs and heuristic evaluation. And the differences between them are quite subtle. <coughs> so in a walkthrough you might get the, uh, the expert, so this is a bit like a key informer you know, when we're going to user requirements. Someone who, you know, has a real understanding of what's required. Get them to go through the system, um, go through the processes that might be involved, and see if it all works. You know, this can be quite technical, so you might want to be, um, you know, you can do it on code. You know, does this bit of code produce the right results? You know, do the algorithms work? You, that's quite basic, you know. But you also, you can do it in a more general way. So you might want to look at things like um, your general user interface, user experience uh, principles, such as progressive disclosure. You can walk through the interface and see if these um, these principles are met. See if your your user interface does actually conform to these best practices. <coughs> you can also do techniques like accessibility. It's it's a well. Uh, well-established technique for testing for accessibility. So, you know, put your stuff on a website, for example, you might want to, uh, you know, walk through, go through the system using a screen reader, you know, try and do the task using a screen reader. Or just go through and see if all the images are alt tags, you know, simple accessibility, things like that. But these, these type of evaluations are, uh, are really, um, really hinge on the quality of the, of the expert you have and uh, the way you pose the questions or the questions you, uh, you want to ask him. You have to think quite carefully about what the tasks you're going to get them to do, the, the walkthrough process is. If you're going to get these to be successful, you need to, like I say, use a good expert and make sure you use them well. Heuristic evaluation is, like I said, very closely related to uh, to walk through, but uh, instead of you know getting people to walk through the whole process, you might have some specific questions which you want to answer, and so you gather some experts and say, Look, "Can you tell me? Do you think this this thing is right?" And you know they'll look at it and come to an opinion and let you know. So in some ways, this is, um, this is similar but looking more specific problems. Mm -hmm. Any questions? So these are sort of things you might perform in a laboratory or in, in a, maybe in an office environment. What about um, field work more generally? Again, we've got the techniques we use for eliciting, eliciting user requirements can be applied to an extent in evaluating. Uh, so we can, instead of you know observing people directly, we can, in a laboratory setting, we can observe them in their natural setting, in their natural habitat, if you like. 
Um, and this is typically used on kind of fairly small groups of people to get quite a, a deep understanding, which is narrow in scope. You get a real deep understanding of how people are using the system, the problems they have, and, uh, and the features they like, and so on. Uh, but in this case, we're using this information to, to see if our original intentions have been um, have come to fruition, if, if we've been successful in our design. Anybody, any ideas or techniques you might use for observing deeper in the wild? Well, the software logging is kind of an obvious one, isn't it? You can, uh, in your early releases, you might want to log a load of uh, data and, uh, and bring that back, see what you get. Why might this be? Why might this be good? A good way of doing, of understanding how your um, system works. So I'll phrase it another way: What problems might you uh, encounter with using more traditional kind of lab-based tests or or interviews? So if people are going to change the way they they behave because they know they're being watched or observed. Yeah, yeah, so that's known as a guinea pig effect. If, if, you, if you're being watched, you don't tend to behave in quite the same way. Any other problems with the traditional kind of lab based techniques? I'm just going to say it's more costly, isn't it? Compared to. Yeah, it can be, it depends. I mean, obviously, I mean, setting up uh, effective ways of gathering data. Uh, in the wild and doing the analysis, it can be time consuming. Um, I guess it's less costly for the uh, participants, so, you know, they're just going about their normal work, but uh, for the UX researcher, it's, it's not necessarily uh, an easier or cheaper or quicker job to do it uh, with wild data. Is it the time constraints? Because you can't sit and watch them all day necessarily, but the audience can be taken away. That's right, yeah, so um, you can do well, certain types of uh, in the wild observations can be done over, over much longer time scales and allow you to gather longitudinal data, which is something we'll touch on in a bit. I was going to say you could gather more data. You can gather more data, yeah. Um, although not, often not uh, as, as rich as, um, as you can get in the laboratory, not as detailed at least. What about any other problems in the, in the lab? But then in the lab you would prepare kind of set of questions or a scenario or something for them to follow. Whereas in real life they just do what they do. They so might not think about sort of... Yeah, so <coughs> you might, um, your tasks might not have you, you designed for your laboratory study. Hopefully they'll be realistic what the people want to do. But if, when people are, if you're doing kind of in the wild observations, you can be sure that people are doing the kind of sort of jobs that they're wanting to do. Yeah, so the tasks are much more likely to be accurate. Yeah. What about <coughs> kind of way people answer questions? You know, do you think this is a um, do you think this is good? Can you see any problems with it? How do you think people respond to those questions if you're asking them directly? You say, well, I ask you, what do you think of my lecture today? You'd more like to say, I guess. Yeah? yeah. <laughs> well, even you think you can it's not people are talking about, whatever, right? You, people, there's a well-known bias that people, a well-known bias that people try and uh, please the questioner. Yeah? So if you're asking them, they, they're trying to, trying to please you. So doing studies in the laboratory, you can, <coughs> or asking people things like you can miss a lot of problems because they're just too polite to say. Doing it in the wild, you can, you can often try to capture these kind of uh, these kind of problems. So uh, people aren't prepared to speak up. So this is uh, this. Oh, I see a guinea pig. Yeah. Role selections. This is um, this is kind of well. 
what I was just saying about people agreeing with you kind of fits in, in both of those. So I do want to uh, please the, the kind of personally elevated status experimenter. And also get for things like the response set, so people are more likely to, to agree with something than to disagree. It's just human nature. Um, what else have we got? So, this isn't to say that laboratory experiments are bad. You, you can, a well designed um, laboratory study will be able to avoid most or all of these problems. And things you need to take uh, careful consideration of when you're designing your, your evaluation. But, uh, but it's not a problem. However, doing studies in the wild can avoid an awful lot of these and can give you really quite a rich and different set of data. So I think you mentioned the possibility of getting uh, data from a, a more data, a longer set of data. <coughs> yeah, this, is, this is longitudinal studies. So these are where you might want to um, you know, collect data over a long period of time, say, from hours, days, possibly even weeks. Um, what sort of scenarios do you think those might be? You might want to do that. What sort of user interface might lend itself to that kind of analysis? Just uh, you can do longitudinal studies with other sorts of data. Values. It doesn't have to be kind of remote, um, you know, key logging that kind of thing. You, you can you know, do observations over an extended period. Uh, so yeah, that that kind of uh, interface, understanding those kind of interactions, really does lend itself well to remote and uh, longitudinal. What about concentrating on longitudinal rather than the, the, the remote? To see how quickly users get used to the interface, and then if they just go quickly to, they remember where to go, and in a few days they just do it much yeah. faster than before. Yeah, time. so you said learnability. Um, yeah. Often, a lot of uh, user interfaces for certain more complex tasks can be quite complex to start with, even if it's well designed, um, it can be quite difficult to get to grips with. Uh, with a new system and doing an evaluation with someone first time, you know, here's this brand new system which does all these amazing things, you know, doing some tests can, can often, you know, you miss out a lot of information if you just do one study at the start. Whereas if you're using longitudinal um, study, if you observe them over a long period of time, you can uh, get a lot more feeling for how learnable the system is and, uh, you know, you can possibly spot areas which are, which are lacking and, and see which areas are doing really well. Um, so this is, longitudinal studies are really useful. I don't think they're really widely, uh, widely done, but um, they, are, they are really useful. Um, could they also be used to measure the level of user engagement over time? So like with, with certain yep. software, um, users might be really happy in the first or second time they use it, but then they just lose interest because it's not... Yeah, um, excellent. Yeah, yeah that's, that's exactly sort of thing. Anybody have any other ideas about uh, longitudinal studies? What sort of things can be used for? Okay, so spotting kind of patterns of behavior. Yeah. You mean? Is that what you're getting at? Should be. Should be. Should be. Should be. I think that, that is a good 
I think that's an important thing in terms of physics and neural forces. So understanding kind of how users are interacting with your user interface so you can predict it in the future, is that? Um, so. um, yeah, I guess so, yeah. I mean, thinking things over, over a long period of time is, uh, is a good way of effectively understanding how people um, get to the system, how they use it, and you know whether it really does a good job or not. A single <coughs> session, you can get much more, often much more rich, much deeper data. Um, you know, you, you can apply uh, better techniques or more detailed techniques to gather a real load of information. Um, so you might want to use eye tracking, and you can get really rich information, really deep information. But it's only a snapshot. Uh, observing longitudinally over a long period of time can give a. It's, it's difficult to get the same amount of detail, but it's. Um, it can give you a kind of different set of data to give you a different view on how people are using. with applications and the web, does that mean that it's so websites? Yeah, so yeah, websites. So, so websites is uh it can be particularly useful. Um, you know what sort of things might you want to do with a, if you're evaluating a website longitudinally. Kind of track the how long it takes to get to certain pages if, if there's lots of clicks in between yeah. set pages you might want to add a If people go this way, this way, this way to get to that page, they might want to go to that. Is that something you use to go to them over long period? Probably all just to get that amount of data. Yeah, you can get something. That, that, that kind of data doesn't necessarily need to be done uh, over long periods of time. All you can do over long periods of time, and we'll, we'll cover this uh, the second half of today, is, is, is things like you know, repeat visits to people come back and look at your site and so on. I seem to put through these these results quickly. Does anyone have any questions about anything we've done this morning? Anything we've done so far? Right, because I've gone on to sign this break already. Uh, let me just have a whiz back for you to see if there's anything else. Well, Maybe what we've done. Um, see if there's anything else you want to uh, discuss about. Yeah, which way? Um, what persona? I forgot it. Personas. Yeah. So a persona is, um, it's you know, essentially an imaginary person, fully described. So you might have one, say, um, for a website. Uh, if you want to test the accessibility, you might create a persona that represents a kind of stereotypical um, user. So. Jane is a 35-year-old professional. She's visually impaired with uh, no eyesight, doesn't seem uh, congenitally blind. She likes to do this kind of thing and that kind of thing. You know, she uses, say, a website. She uses web, the web for this, that, the other. You know, she wants to perform these kind of tasks. She wants to use this website for booking holiday flights and so on. So that's, you, you build up this imaginary character um, and you can then test your website, look, take this persona and uh, test, get your website and say, well look, can, can someone like this, would they be able to do that using the user interface at the moment? So you take a look at user interface and say, well actually, you know, <coughs> these steps here, are really quite complicated. To do this on screen reader, to find these fields on screen reader would be really hard. Can we, can we redesign that? So a persona is a, let's say, an imaginary uh, uh, detailed but rich description of, of the type of user you might expect to have in the system. And 
sort of tasks they might want to do with it. Um, is it is it uh, is it correct to say that that they're only used for testing? Though I sort of have this understanding that that their aim is also to um, keep in mind throughout the development process that you're designing for humans. And yeah, so you have these absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So I think nearly all the techniques do use testing have. have are either used themselves or have very similar equivalents that are used for requirements gathering. So personas is exactly the sort of thing you might use for requirements gathering. You know, what are our, who, who are the sort of people we wanted to use our interface? You know, come up with some personas and then while you're designing the interface, keep those in mind. You know, and when you're testing, test against them. You know, does our do we achieve the uh, the goals we set for these these particularly users, these types of users. So how, how that test can be uh, valid uh, unless we get an actual blind person only? It, in the case of the blind person, you can easily kind of simulate that and close your eyes, but let's say that... Well, that's the... If you say that, that's the, you, you can't, it, it doesn't really work like that, so... Yeah, uh, for example, if you could the design system for a mentally disabled person, how would you, you know, how would you test that? You have to apply the general principles, so, you know, your persona will describe the problems that this particular character has. And as a user, UX designer, you will understand how you can get around these certain problems. So, you know, there are standard techniques for you know, presenting information. Yeah, well, what I was trying to say is that unless you are a necessarily set person, you don't really know what the problems are. Oh, yeah, well, no, no, I don't think it's necessarily the case at all. You can, you know, you People have a good understanding of these. It's so, you know, the way you present the information, the type of language you use, can be uh, can be tailored to a particular audience. So, you know, you can tailor for, for children, you can tailor for different types of audiences. It's not really easy to do, but it, it can be done. Why not so and so folks? I mean, why not just have like a list? Just say, does the site work for someone's dad? Does the site work for someone's blind? <coughs> the green dot. You know, why, why make this whole kind of character thing? Well, yeah, it's um, so one is, you know, if you can use them throughout the whole process, you know, it does keep in mind that these are real people. Right? Just asking the question, does it work for people who are blind, is, is kind of, you know, it's not <coughs> enough, but it's not something you can evaluate against really directly. So with a persona, you can, um, you know, it has particular attributes and particular tasks. And you will use a, a selection of personas. Uh, you know, it's. But the, 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 I think the issue with persona is that you kind of specialise in almost too much, maybe. I think so you've got to have lots of different personas where you can just very easily do a point of checklist. Isn't it the opposite to that? Isn't it using combinations? Because we can have a list, like you suggested, surely you're just saying, well, first we'll look at this, then we'll look at this. But a persona could have like, a combination of them, but to a lesser degree, so you could maybe see how that has an effect. Yeah, I mean, that's one of these. You, you, you can't have personas to, to uh, cover all eventualities, so it's not a uh, replacement for you know, a checklist. Do we follow the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines? Mm. Yeah. But it does help you keep in mind during the analysis process or the requirements gathering process and the design process um, the sort of things you need to um, have in your user interface so that these types of people can use it and then you can check again to make sure you've done it as part of you know as part of the way of testing. And of course, you know, you want to test with real users, so you've got your personas, you know, it's, it appears to work for them. Let's get some blind users in, get them to test it, let's get some um, people with mental disabilities and we get them tested if they're part of our target audience. So they're not um, a replacement for you know other types of user testing, but they go along with, along with it and they can follow through the whole process. What else do we have on that list? Um, is, um, Okay, so we, this whole range of uh, techniques, uh, it's not a question of choosing one from the list, right? It's, 
you know, choose the, the most appropriate ones. And that's probably a combination. Uh, what's the difference between wireframes and the mock-up? Is it a boss? Um, essentially, a mock-up is, is slightly more detailed. So, you know, a wireframe, you might want to just, you know, just come up with a quick sketch of, of what you use your interface looks like. Whereas a Wizard of Oz mock-up will perhaps go through more of a uh, more of a process of interaction. So, you know, in this step, you have a a task and go through in each each step of that task, or each step of the process of achieving that task, what the uh, what the user might come across. Any other questions? <coughs> okay, well in that case we'll come back in fifteen minutes and we have got discussions about the techniques you want to use for uh, the gathering of some information. Any other questions for each other? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.
Ukraine is just. Uh, you guys have this. Yeah. 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 I think yeah, mine kind of I still have to get one. Not that you have to get one Yeah, but no, no, because I work with someone and I'm So I got left out for yeah, all of my It's kind of a But yeah, for a
submitted at 10.55. And then when I was looking at the document, we were, I realised it's not references, but off the page. Yeah, I'm sorry, I think I'm going to resubmit five minutes later, just going to rewrite it, and then we'll go on a thing and have to change it. Yeah, because then, like, as soon as mine was dirty, and then Martin was, I came home, and I realized one of my errors, you know, for the, e, you know, the ERC mesh, one that I would do the wrong way around, so I had to, like, fix that error back up, I had to log into the school web, fix it, and then put that one image in it. Then I had to resubmit again, and go, it's just a pain in the ass, like, you know, but I'm going to put images in it. In a little foot, not a foot, a caption, a little bit of a pain in the ass, isn't it? So I have to fix that as well. I think I'd definitely have that issue. Yeah. 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 And then I think it's just the captions. You know. So I did it. I got all the captions. I copied them. I put it into a, a little uh, text box. And then what I did was, uh, um, so, and it was just a lot better to do because I already put a group to the image. So I can move it around nicely to the uh, So I did that instead. Like, yeah. I'll take those and my tables. Yeah. <coughs>
Any questions? Trialic elicitation is kind of closely related to card sorting. But what you're doing here is you're giving people um, three cards at a time, as the name suggests. And you want them to divide them into a pair and uh, another card and to explain their reasoning. And this forces people to, to make a decision to, you know, there's always going to be one which is more closely related to the, another than the third. To pick my right. If you've got two types of things, you know, for, it's, much, it's always going to be easier to pair. Let me give you an example. So, you got three things. This one is always going to be more similar to either that one or that one. Yeah? You're always going to be able to pair it for one another for whatever reason. So it, it kind of forces people to make these distinctions and can give you information which is very difficult to get out otherwise, especially as part of the process to get people to explain their decisions. So you might want, for example, to, um, to give people uh, cards representing, go back to our information structure example, three different pages, and say, you know, put these into two groups, you know, these three cards into two groups and explain why. So they choose which two become a pair. And that information and the process of them kind of having to make that decision and having to elucidate that decision can give you quite a bit of information about how things should be grouped and which things go together. Other techniques, which are kind of more closely related to the, the first of that list, are uh, analytics. So, you know, we're gathering quantitative data um, on our design, but in this case we're using um, unobtrusive methods. So, whereas in the, the other ones we're looking at, you know, actively involving the users, asking them what do you think, um, can you tell us about this? We can also collect data unobtrusively. Uh, and this, the kind of data you, you gather can be divided broadly into, into two groups, um, which have been named, I forget the, the researchers, but they've been grouped into uh, named Pulse and Heart, which comes from the, uh, the acronyms. So, Pulse <coughs> analytics include things like page reviews, uptimes, this is to design the websites. So how often does the page get viewed? Yeah. How, long, how much time is the system up? What sort of delays are there? Um, are people still happy after you know, after seven days? Yeah. How many people start using the system and then drop off? Um, or if you, you've got a commercial website application, how much income is it bringing in? These um, attributes are fairly easily quantified and fairly easily measured unobtrusively. So the user doesn't need to know that you're collecting this information, but you can be a site as a whole and you can gather this quantitative data. Do people come back to the website? You know? That kind of stuff. That's all very well. But it's not that rich, the data isn't that rich. It can give you useful information, but there's a lot more you might need to know. So, if people are coming back to your website, is that a good thing or a bad thing? A good thing, yeah? A good thing. Often if they're coming back because they couldn't do what they wanted to do the first time. You know, they tried to do it and they failed, so I'll give up, come back again later. You know, that's, that's not good. Yeah, so you want to collect, um, more kind of social, soft information, if you like, if you can. 
and that's, that kind of covers the hard stuff. So are people happy with the, soft, with the information, with the software? Are they engaged with it? Um, what are their adoption rates like? Do people uh, start using it and continue to use it, or do they uh, try and give up? That's retention. And then, of course, task success. So do people actually manage to do the tasks they want to do? That can be quite difficult to measure with, but with things like with just you know basic site stats for a website. But um, if you can gather this kind of information, you've got a lot more rich understanding of how people view your system, a much better data for which to evaluate whether it works. Do you notice anything about that? Simon's asked the question. It took me a while to spot what he was asking about. Anybody? Well, I think what he was trying to get at is that um, with the parts like analytics, a lot of this can actually be got um, from slightly unusual sources and for free, if you like. So, how might you want to? Uh, Measure happiness. Say you go to a website, you've got a website, web application. How, how, how might you develop whether people actually like it or not? How might you test, measure whether people like it or not through unobtrusive methods? Social, social media, see if anyone's talking about it and what they're talking about, it, if they're happy, and you kind of measure that through. Yeah. yeah, do people like it? Yeah, so things like Facebook, like, or Google plus one, these kind of things. Um, you know, they're almost expected on a website nowadays, but they can be uh, also used to give you quite useful, valuable information about whether people are engaged with your your application, whether they're finding it useful, whether they enjoy using it, whether they like it. You know, if you've got a uh, percent of visitors to your site clicking the like button. You're doing something right, probably about 60% of them actually like it. You know, quite a fair portion will actually like it, but they could, could say 20% could be bothered to, uh, to click the button. So, this kind of information which you can get almost for free, you know, it's not part of the standard the Google Analytics stuff, can, can give you quite rich data on, um, on the kind of softer side of things, whether people are really liking your site or not. So this is a, 